doing this. Yeah. So how many eventually have? Uh, 124, I think. 124. It's pretty good actually. I see. So normally, what, how many? That is just on Zoom. We'll probably have a similar number on Facebook. And, uh, so normally, that is just on Zoom. I'll have to rejoin because my video is not working. I'll have to rejoin because my video is not Good evening. Good evening. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I think so, hopefully after today, uh -huh. we will be all wheels inside us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is it's a, it's a very good way to learn a lot more about the overall organization. <laughs> yeah. So, Suresh was telling that uh, 124 uh, have joined? Yes, I have registered. Mm -hmm. so generally, the ratio from registered to actual showing up, generally I have seen anywhere from 35% to 45%. Uh -huh. So, I would expect uh, between 40 to 50. Oh, 40 to 50. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an evening event. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, definitely as even in the daytime, uh, I did an event uh, for Pan IIT uh -huh. on uh, bringing the Vedanta philosophy message uh, during the times of COVID stress. Uh -huh. And we had um, 830 people registered. Uh -huh. The total, we had about 330, 340 uh -huh. on the um, actual attendance. Okay. So it's a good indication of the ratio. <laughs> okay. Who else we have on the line? I see a couple of more people. Maybe Pradeep ji. Hello, Pradeep. Hello, Pradeep.
Suresh, can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Shanti, how are you? Fine. Good evening, Ramanji. Namaste, namaste, everybody. Increase the volume. Prashant ji, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello, and friends. Decrease it slightly. Uh, we can hear you quite clearly, Ramanji. Hanji, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, okay, I'll start. Yes, please. Hello, friends. Uh, good morning in India. Good evening in the US and good day elsewhere. Welcome to our webinar on Atmanirvar Bharat in the context of national security, a patriot's perspectives. I am Prashant Nivaskar, an alumnus of IIT Bombay, class of 1973. I am a retired chemical industry executive, now living in Dallas, Texas. I am part of the 
leadership team at the Wheels Global Foundation and also member of its Energy Council. My bio, as well as the bios of the distinguished speakers will be projected on the screen. In the interest of uh, time, I will only make brief introductions and request you to refer to our banners and website for more details on our uh, distinguished speakers. Wheels is an initiative of Pan IIT and was started in 2006 and, uh, and formally incorporated as a 501c3 entity in the US and also a section eight company in India. Wheels simple mission is to improve the lives in rural India by technology enabled solutions. Where solutions do not exist, we engage our IITs and other similar institutions for further innovation towards self sustainable and scalable solutions. To achieve our mission, we work collaboratively with proven NGOs and other partners such as Mission Samriddhi, Magan Sangrahale, Win Foundation, CII, IEEE-ISV, and SOBUS. Our projects cover six areas as our name suggests, wheels, that is water, health, education, energy, livelihood, and sustainability. Some examples of our exciting projects, each with a scaling ramp to millions of people are spring rejuvenation in Himachal Pradesh, rural telemedicine centers providing quality and affordable care, newborn and mother in a nutritional health, safe farmers initiative, sanitary pads for rural girls and women, spoken tutorials to bring IT skills to masses, smart village in Aravli, and uh, social business entrepreneurship in Pandarpur, Maharashtra. A brief introduction to Wheels activities was presented at the start of the event and will also run at conclusion. We are a volunteer organization and depend on the generosity of our many donors who share our vision of impacting 20% of India's rural and semi-urban population by 2030. You can also get additional information at our website, which is www.wheelsglobal.org. In November, from 11 to 14, Wheels, together with Pan IIT, Stanford University, Banaras Hindu University, will be hosting the seventh annual village conference in uh, Banaras. Some of the confirmed speakers include Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Swami Gaurang Prasad, Vice Chancellor Sudhir Jain, Mr. Arjun Malhotra, Dr. Sunny Anand of Stanford, and many others. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chief Minister Adityanath Yogi are also invited as speakers. Today's event is part of our series of thought leadership events where prominent persons like our today's speaker share their unique and inspiring perspectives on India and the world. We have conducted over 22 such events during last two years, and you can find them all on our website. A quick disclaimer, all views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are their own and do not reflect nor are endorsed by Wheels Global and Charitable Foundation or its board and its members. Now some housekeeping messages. All attendees are on mute through the webinar. You may ask questions to the speakers by entering it on Q&A box. If you need any help, you can chat with one of us by raising your hand or typing your request in the chat box. A recording of this event will also be available on our website and on YouTube and Facebook. Questions from the audience will be curated and channeled to the speakers. It's now my distinct honor to introduce our moderator, Ambassador Pradeep Kapoor. Uh, he also happens to be an IIT alumnus. He graduated from IIT Delhi in 1977 and joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1979 and attended the rank of Secretary Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India in 2013. Described as a luminary diplomat, he was first in his batch to be appointed as ambassador in the year 2000. He served as 
first as India's ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia, and later as ambassador to the Republic of Chile. He has written many books. The latest title, Beyond COVID-19, uh, Leveraging Technology for Better Healthcare, is a bestseller on Amazon. He is on the advisory board of Wheels Global Foundation and is leading the Smart Village Development Initiative. He is a frequent commentator on TV on matters pertaining to India's foreign affairs and security. I now request Ambassador Kapoor to make a few remarks about tonight's event and introduce Vice Admiral Puriji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prashantji, for the introduction. Namaste, everybody, and welcome to this webinar from all the different corners of the world. Uh, in the many webinars that Wheels has hosted in the past few years, uh, we have learned a lot about policies, about practices, about the processes that have become a basis for our own understanding of, and our work in the area of rural development and rural empowerment. Now, as we all know, everybody faces many challenges on dealing with the government rules, regulations, skills, requirements, etc. Therefore, the objective for today's webinar is also to learn more about the following. Hey, Abhi, can we do without What this? does, uh, can somebody mute uh, Admiral Puri? Oh, no, no, Admiral no, no, no. Puri? Uh, uh, the, the charges. Can we mute Admiral Puri, please? Uh, that will not work. My computer is no Thank you. Uh, the objective for today's webinar, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, is for all of us to learn more about the following. What does Atma Nirbhar Bharat mean? And what does it imply to any activity, including the activities of the government itself? How do organizations, including NGOs and other entities in India and around the world, walk the talk? Uh, this webinar offers uh, an opportunity to learn from a very highly respected leader and a patriot who has put his life on the line in the defense of India and led a highly skilled naval force uh, with many challenges. Challenges of not only leading battles, but also navigating the complex challenges of buying, training, implementing state-of-the-art technologies. In this context, the clarion call for Atma Nirbharta or self-reliance takes on a whole new meaning and challenge. We are therefore very fortunate that today we have one of the highest ranking naval officers from India to share his experiences and thoughts on the subject that weighs heavy on one of the fastest growing economies in the world and among the mightiest armed forces. A few words about Vice Admiral Raman Puriji. Vice Admiral Puri was commissioned in the Indian Navy in January 1966. He's a gunnery and missile specialist. He holds a master's degree in defense studies from the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. He is also an alumnus of the Command and General Staff College from the erstwhile USSR and the National Defense College in New Delhi. He has held a number of important command and staff appointments during his distinguished career, including command of five frontline warships of the Indian Navy, including the aircraft carrier INS Vikrant and some of the other ships 
which I had the opportunity to welcome in my postings as ambassador in different countries. He saw action in 1971 war. Prior to his retirement, he was the chief of the integrated staff to the chairman, chief of staffs committee. He has been a passionate supporter of R&D and indigenous production of defense equipment as he believes that a nation cannot have an independent foreign policy without being self-reliant in armament production. And it is because of people like him that we see the tremendous advances which India is making in becoming self-reliant in armament production. During his tenure as CISC, a number of bold initiatives were implemented to strengthen the higher defense management of the armed forces. These included streamlining of the acquisition process, development of industry academia armed forces partnership for formulating the indigenous solution to the needs of the armed forces, the development of the defense space vision for the armed forces, etc. The Admiral was also a key member of the committee established by the government of India to examine changes in the acquisition process and enable a greater participation by the private sector in defense production. He has also been advisor to Bharat Electronics Limited, BEL, which I dealt with closely during my work with the government. And he was on the board of Hindustan Aeronautics Limited till September 2009. He is also associated currently with NGOs and works towards educating and guiding youth towards a career in the armed forces. With such a glorious you know, contribution, may I now request Admiral Puri to give his presentation in about 25 to 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Over to you. Admiral Puri, please unmute yourself and then please start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant ji. Thank you, um, Pradeep ji. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be able to uh, talk to, to your foundation and the IIT uh, alumni of North Texas and other IIT alumni who are joining this webinar. Um, I'm really honored that you have thought it fit that I should be speaking uh, on this occasion. Uh, the subject before me is Atmanirvarta and national security. I National security, as you know, over the years has become a very complex issue requiring a whole of government approach to practically anything, any situation that faces the country, be it uh, in the strategic sphere or in the economic sphere. And uh, in the strategic sphere, as you know, both the armed forces and the diplomats have to work very closely with each other. And uh, sometimes the armed forces are supporting the diplomats, or sometimes they are supporting the armed forces. But it is not just restricted to that. Fundamentally, a, a national security depends on the nation's comprehensive national power. And this includes practically a number of activities, whether it is the uh, security of energy in the country, security of food, security. So any, any number of critical things, transportation, all these beyond the, just the armed forces go on to impact on national security. And nothing in national security works without at least three, four departments or ministries of the national of the government of India coming together. But in the real world, essentially, it is exercised in basically four, dom four domains. They are the military, the diplomatic domain, the technological informational domain, and the economic, and the economic domain. 
which includes i mean whether it is your uh, uh, you know transportation systems or whether it is your uh, energy systems everything goes and ultimately goes and impacts on the economy and on the way a na nation can secure it um, uh, its security requirements and the livelihood of people for that matter i will today try and deal with each of these four elements as to how they have impacted us and why it is it is necessary to be to have atmanirbharta to be able to uh, for the nation to be able to secure its interests in the world today as i look at it the governance of the world if i was look, trying to look at it as a whole perhaps is you know worse than the worst governed country in the world maybe it is somewhere timbuktu or wherever it is because it is all governed by self interest and basically it's a big jungle raj where every nation is looking after its self interest policies change alignments change everything changes according to one self interest so we have to see in the past i must say that this aspect was perhaps missing in our thought process itself, starting from our independence if we look at 19 uh, i mean after independence we we should not have had the kashmir issue today before us if we had taken the right decisions at that time there was no need to go to the united nations so we are today in that situ situation with pakistan because of the mistakes that were carried out at the strategic level and here i want to say you know strategic errors whether they be in the economic sphere or in the dip, uh, in the strategic sphere or any other sphere today at once you may you do something that is not in your interest it becomes very difficult to rectify the situation it costs a lot and it costs a lot of blood money everything else and resources so we at this situation come to 1965 we returned haji peer we uh, you know we didn't get the full impact of what we had done on the battlefield i mean i next week if we come down to 71 we return 93000 soldiers what did we get in return a paper agreement called shimla agreement and uh, the worst thing is we returned 93000 of their boys we didn't get back even some of uh, a few uh, a few dozen of pows who were there in the pakistani jails and some of them are rotting there even today so my point is that we have to be very hard nosed as far as our self interest is concerned when dealing with world affairs so 71 we won the war, battles very much but i think on the diplomatic table we lost the war so what caused it i am i am not privy to maybe at, uh, ambassador kapoor will be able to throw more light on the subject but the fact is here we are we had a golden opportunity to sort out our affairs with pakistan but we didn't do it next we come down to the china problem what made us take action on tibet the way we took it it was a wonderful buffer why did we have to recognize it as part of anyway whatever be the reasons at that point in time and later why did we have to give up our security council seat somebody must ask so my point is that the first thing today and i think this lesson has been learned very well and put into practice in recent years by the government today that we will look after our self interest and that's the first thing and to look after our self interest the next important thing is apart from uh, you know the economic aspect every other aspect strategically we have to be strong and that cannot happen if we are not atmanirbhar 
and in this area i would say let's look at our policy we were starting with things like the our telecom policy where it was brought out very clearly at the highest level and i was personally involved in it to tell the government of that day which was somewhere in 2004 2005 that look you introduce this policy there will there will be no cyber, we will be hard pressed for cyber security and our electronic industry will die we were at that point in time in 2004 2005 almost 50% of our electronic goods requ uh, component requirements were met from within the country today it is less than 20% now the government is taking a lot of effort to revive but you see the cost that we are going to pay and the time it will take next who negotiations why did we allow all electronic goods to come in this country at zero duty for whatever pressures i am not aware of but i can't understand it created a situation of inverted duty structure in the country and that is what added to our woes of the telecom of our electronic industry it is not that we didn't have the brains or we didn't know what to do i know of a small company which today is doing wonderful work all over the world but can't do it in india because of these structures that we have created so anyway so the point i am making is that atmanirbharta has to be looked at in its wholesome way it requires sound policies not just policies that we will build every equipment in india but it has to be supported by by our, our diplomatic efforts it has to be supported by our economic efforts in our economic policies our commerce policies in commerce where we we ensure that it is the interest of india that guides us and not some moral stand somewhere in the world i mean the way we recognize some of the pat uh, some patents which i i find are against the indian law in the parliament but we still have those um, in, in practice they are still followed and and courts are unable to intervene for whatever reason the fact is that it is going to hurt our our even our hardware industry if we continue to exercise un, understand uh, uh, keep on recognizing those patents which is not required i think software patents if they are not uh, resulting in any hardware inter, uh, innovation as per india law indian law don't have to be recognized but it doesn't happen so the, the this is the situation as far as i would say uh, the the requirements to build an At atmanirbhar india the second thing i want to come down to is we have been the the uh, the situation that we landed up uh, due to the policies that were followed which a destroyed our culture and our education system and second brought about what i would call a situation where we uh, probably lost self confidence in ourselves and that starts i mean i would recommend everybody please read macaulay's statement and perhaps go to the archives in india to understand what he really said because google will i mean you will not get it on the internet these days the fact is macaulay felt that india was an uncivilized country i mean he called it uncivilized for his own reasons and that we had to change both the culture and the education system in india for it to grow and the start point of that was he found that the moral values etc that were in their country were such that the country with the highest level of in, uh, literacy was called uncivilized the moral values were high the literacy levels were high but in our own 
in, in our own language and in our culture. We will not be behind in, in science and technology either. So we miss, miss the industrial revolution for various reasons. So my point is that the, the what Macaulay started resulted in a system which A, brought a loss of self-confidence in the country of us. Yeah, I mean, when I was young, everything imported was better than what we could do. And uh, that, uh, that fear continued. And I must say, uh, you know, as far as the armed forces are concerned, we became so, everything had to be under license production, to be state of art. Uh, it was a struggle for our R&D establishments, etc., to introduce, uh, to put equipment that was indigenously designed into, the, in, into, uh, into production. Uh, I mean, they just, today everybody is clapping, but the privations that it has, this, this is, it had to, the, uh, the, uh, the privations that both the R&D organizations had to go through um, is something that uh, one can write a book on. And uh, I remember way back in 2007, 8, after my retirement, I actually wrote an article on it in, in the Hindu newspaper. I don't know if it is still there available, but it was written by me and one Dr. Ashok Parthasarthi, where I said, whereas this country should be clapping at our achievement, we are all moaning about it. I, I don't want to go into the details, but part of it was our procedural and lack of faith in what we could do. And of the three, and of course, I would say the amount of lobbying that takes that took place with, uh, in in the defense area, as opposed to what happened in the both the Department of Atomic Energy and the and the Department of Space, which were kept isolated from the lobbies. And lobbies, I mean, I mean the defense contractors, the various, uh, I would say, even uh, universities in the U.S. and and number of consultants that we keep employing, all because we don't have faith in our, our own selves. Now, this situation, fortunately, led to uh, unfortunately led to a factor that when we do license production and produce something. What we are actually doing is getting something at if the IIT, IIT students will understand at what we call technology readiness level number nine, which is item is ready, you take it as a black box and operate it. Even when you produce it, the, the, uh, the, uh, the concept, the fundamental knowledge, uh, the know why of the system is not with you. You only get know how as to how to operate and productionize with critical elements coming from somewhere all over the world. And this means, as far as the armed forces are concerned, if your critical equipment and your critical platforms are coming from X, Y, Z, then you are there in a dependent situation for at least the next 25, 30 years. Even upgrading that equipment, you'll have to go somewhere else because you don't understand the software that has gone into the whole thing. So my view is that whatever else we do, we must design our own equipment. And fortunately, the situation because of the, uh, I would say, the fortitude of our scientists in various areas and even in our product, some of our production agencies, we have today a capability that we don't need anybody's help to design our armor, armored tanks, guns, anything. Most of our ammunition. The problem is only that when we buy something from outside, then you buy their ammunition also. Then you land up in a situation where you have to 
practically do fundamental work to be able to work to produce that emanation in the country because nobody transfers that technology to you. So we are in a situation today that we have, fortunately, I would say, today the leadership in the country, which has understood this aspect very well and is progressing with policies that ensure that Artan Nirbhata succeeds. And that is why you have in, I mean, today you have the Tejas going full guns, Tejas Mark II will come, AMCA will come, all the basic, I am not saying that we need to become an autarky and import nothing. But fact is, the fundamental design, its concept should be, of the platform should be with you. And even if you have to import uh, subsystems or systems, you know what to do if, if there is a uh, supply chain breakup. You know, if you try and do things with multiple sources, but that is important. Uh, if you want to, if you want to increase our self-reliance quotient in the country. So today, as I said, whether it is design of ships, whether it is design of submarines, frankly, if you ask me, I don't even understand why we are going in for this, uh, you know, uh, so-called tender on, on our next submarine uh, buy uh, in the open market. I, I don't, I just don't understand it. Having designed uh, and built uh, a, a nuclear submarine, there is no reason why we can't do a conventional summary. But whatever be the reason for it, I personally don't understand it, but I, I do not know what, what makes us go in that direction. But it will just definitely be today are in a situation where we will have our own uh, air independent propulsion system. So there is no reason why we should be ready, which should be soon be available to us. So why we should go in for another submarine which has got an air AIP system which becomes critical for that submarine come from somewhere else. So anyway, these are the things that are necessary. And I believe that for reasons I have stated, self-reliance in this area is essential. And to do that, leadership, as I said, whether it is the issue of taking the right strategic decisions, whether it is the to push Atmanirbharta, which I would, I, I must really be grateful and uh, to Prime Minister Modi for the way he has pushed Atmanirbharta in practically every sphere of our activities, whether it is uh, armament, whether it is in our when we had to meet this challenge of COVID. I mean, we would have been in a very difficult situation if we did not have the two vaccines that have saved India domestically produced. It, it would have been an unaffordable proposition to have them imported from somewhere. A, their availability wouldn't be in the, in the numbers that we wanted. And B, uh, the cost would just be prohibitive. But I would say that the way we came up to meet the challenge of uh, COVID, uh, but it was, a, it was a clear indication as to why Atma Nirvarta, even in a situation like a pandemic is necessary for a country like India with a huge population to deal with that situation. And uh, I would say that uh, the push that we are giving in this direction is very essential today. The last thing I would like to talk about is the importance of culture in all this. I started with talking about Macaulay and what he had done to uh, what the changeover of destroying our complete education system that has existed in the country, uh, closing down, uh, Sanskrit became a language which, which couldn't, I mean, just all Gurukuls were shut down. 
the the government of the day the british government of the day recommended uh, he recommended to the british government that not a penny be spent on oriental education because this unci- this is an uncivilized population and we need to civilize them to serve us so we even we the education system was geared up to teach us how to serve their masters which meant and the law system the the various laws that were created and i wonder why we are continuing with some of them though this government is now making it i believe every law that was there prior to 1947 needs to be changed because those laws were meant not i mean uh, whatever justice they provided fine but they were meant to basically ensure that we were treated as people who could not be trusted that has gone into our financial systems in the country we the uh, ambassador talked about the difficulties with the uh, procedures these procedures are all designed to uh, were designed and i think some of them are being changed now to to ensure that each one of us was thought had to prove that he was speaking the correct uh, was not lying i mean whether it if i went for with a uh, with a proposal to the the finance always wanted to see if i was not making money out of it i i don't say that some people will maybe then the system has to be such to take charge of that particular element but not paint the whole system in a way that nothing things move very slowly or sometimes don't move at all so i believe that uh, in the the uh, loss of this change of our education system which now fortunately now is being trying to correct the new education policy that has come is like to connect and i suppose that will increase the level of self confidence of our younger generation in ourselves and uh, i i and this will these things are necessary we have to understand that ours is the oldest our culture our cultural journey does not start with either the sultanates that came to india or the moguls that came for later on or the british who came there we are a much older civilization and the civilization could not have lasted there was no reason for mr macaulay to call this an uncivilized nation and then bring about changes which which have caused i i believe in the nation uh, a total loss of confidence and it is only now in the last i would say last 10 years or so that things have started to change and change for the better and i and this is where the alumni from iits and all that the start the startup culture that has been put into the country is a very good measure but i would say um, we have started the startup culture and this is one thing i would like to put before the iit graduates uh, alumni here are a youngsters who many startups have come many unicorns have come our youngsters are able to bring thing uh, make real innovations up to proof of concept in the startup that they have come probably make a prototype type production but then to really make that product go into the market you then require funding venture funding or whatever other funding you call which has been for whatever reasons uh, is is not uh, uh, as it should be with the result they get bought up by everyone all all sunder and uh, often the chinese i think spend the most in venture fund funds in, in this country uh, we need to be careful the policies need to uh, see and uh, there is now a clause in the national uh, towards to see that uh, things of national security interest remain within the country but we need to have a system that will ensure that this happens so th- this is the 
uh, ambassador uh, sure. I, i think i have like already exceeded my time well <laughs> says that uh, you have laid out a very beautiful premise hmm. for the discussion and it may now be a good idea to yeah uh, start the discussion also yeah if you don't mind yeah we we'll can do that we have done a very very good job of uh, you know the in- introducing the entire uh, different aspects of the uh, process of atmanirbhata and where india is and where india should be headed uh, what i'd like to say here at this point is firstly thank you for this uh, very beautiful uh, opening remarks and comments now you also raised this point about uh, india giving back those 93000 prisoners of war etc i just have an interesting uh, input on that from one of my colleagues in the foreign service who was present at the meeting between the indian prime minister and the pakistani prime minister in simla which led to the simla agreement and return of those pows without any sort of uh, reasonable expectation now what happened as i was told by you know our colleagues in the foreign service was that uh, there were a lot of demands from the indian side officially put on the table uh, zulfikar ali bhutto was there and the negotiations were not making much headway ultimately and this is uh, from the eye witnesses there he fell at the feet of the indian prime minister mrs indira gandhi touched her feet and begged her to release those pows uh, you know in the say for the sake of his survival itself and that suddenly led to the culmination of the discussions and negotiations and an agreement without any sort of returns or rewards to the winners first time in the history where the winners gave away all so a similar statement was made by even uh, farooq abdullah to me that on the one hand india claims the pakistani occupied kashmir as indian territory when you get some part of that territory by very hard fought battles and wars and instead of keeping it with india because that is legitimately indian territory you surrender it back to pakistan so what happens to your claim thereafter if this is what you are doing every time so that was his question that how can you keep your claims as legitimate claims similarly we saw that uh, strategically we have been not the best of uh, you know thinkers and nations the agreements with the chinese which the british handed to india gave us the rights of full telecom full postal services full trading services within tibet and in 1955 we through treaty gave away all those rights to china without anything at all in return now imagine if those rights to all the postal communication telecom communication and trading rights were still vested in india today nobody in the world would have accepted china's claims of sovereignty over tibet so that has been unfortunate legacy there are so many instances which i as a you know practicing diplomat have come across but what i'd like to ask you at this point of time is firstly the you know indian armed forces a very capable jcos ncos jawans from all the different services now many of them even officers after their retirement they settle back in the villages so here we have a very efficient very skilled very highly trained manpower available to the country in the rural areas of the country the rural part of india comprises 897 million people 
897 million people is more than the population of the Western world combined, US and Europe or North America and South America, the two biggest continents combined, have less population than the rural India. Also, 35%, uh, sorry, 65% of the population of India is less than 35 years old. Now, Wheels is working in all these aspects of, uh, you know, water, healthcare, etc., in the rural areas. How can there be greater synergies between wheels and this phenomenal manpower, high quality resource available in the rural communities. Because if we have to achieve the targets of $5 trillion economy in the, you know, in India in the next few years, three, four years, without capitalizing on the rural communities' resources and synergies, uh, it is not possible to achieve that. So any thoughts about this to shift our focus to where wheels work or role or the wheels uh, roll? Anyway, before I just answer this little word, uh, we are suffering. We I thought in Shimla agreement when we signed, we suffered from the Prithviraj Chauhan syndrome, where we excused Mr. Ghazni 17 times after defeating him. And the 18th time when he got a chance, he, he did Mr. Prithviraj Chauhan in. I think this, you know, the business of uh, forgiveness, compassion, which is part of our culture, it, it need not be carried forward in the diplomatic sphere. Their self-interest, self-interest, self-interest must govern us and nothing else. And we need, and uh, compassion towards uh, in these areas are, are dangerous for the country. Anyway, um, the second thing I would like to say is that the situation today, if you see with what has happened in Galwan or them, we started with Jamkok, Galwan, shows us that when we decide and we back up and take a firm stand, then we are in much, uh, we are able to hold our own. This has in, increased the level of self incontent whether it was the, uh, you know, strike that we, uh, st uh, strike that we made after Uri into Pakistan, the surgical strikes, or the uh, air attack that took place thereafter. All this have tremendously increased the self-confidence in the country. And I must give and I would advise everybody to see these uh, two serials, which are Avrodh Serial 1 and Avrodh Serial 2. Incidentally, Admiral uh, Sahib, my elder brother, who was from the Armed Forces of India, hmm. uh, he is acting in the serial Avrodh Season 2. Episode. Yeah. yeah so. I, I would really advise people to see that because I think the by and large, some dramatics will be there in a, in a, in a serial, but by and large, they reflect the truthful state of the decision makers of that time, especially the prime minister himself. Uh, it's, it's, uh, coming to your point about how, well, there is uh, there's supposed to be an ex-servicemen signing board in all uh, states. Uh, I not, don't understand why these are all headed by bureaucrats, frankly, uh, but uh, which, uh, they all have uh, they all have a, a database of the resource that is available there. The second thing, of course, is again I come back to Arthur. If, if you are only prepared to increase the innovation level that comes within the from the uh, from the rural areas and try to use it, will it uh, will that prosper? Otherwise, we will if we continue to say okay, the solution will come from X, Y, and Z all over the world, then uh, the, the, uh, there is nothing for that uh, resource that is available there to contribute. So if he has to contribute, then the fundamental change has to take place in our thinking of what Gandhiji said. That in, in the rural areas, do I need the most advanced technology to improve the lives of the people there? Do I need 5G in the, those areas? I don't know. Frankly, I, I think even 3G will be good enough for most of the things that they are doing all the time. 
I mean, there are so many say ultimately in my in a phone. What do I use? WhatsApp and messages. That's all. And speak to people. So we have to see what is the LCM of technology that we need in those places. Yeah. yeah. And then see. I mean, it's all a policy and other. And I, I am sure the uh, the human being there will be prepared to uh, contribute. Actually, if if I was to say. We throw out, throw almost fifty thousand uh, soldiers, airmen, and uh, naval people to the wolves after they retired at the age of thirty-five, thirty-six. Yeah, yeah, and that has to stop. Yes, and that can only stop if the village economy itself comes up. Yeah, and the innovations that are available to do, and if that is what the IIT alumni can help, that. We make the villagers realize that there's a lot of potential in them. Then it will work. I mean, there there are of course uh, small initiatives that have taken place. As I am, a few that I know in Maharashtra, I mean, they, which have changed the lives of the villagers. So that that has to, I think, that has to come about. Yeah. Uh, we have to see what technology is relevant. We don't have to adopt technology for the sake of, uh, you know, state of art. I say that even in the armed forces, you have to see what is relevant to me, what beats the challenge, and not uh, use this word "state of art" to buy everything that we can from everywhere, without knowing what the state of art is most of the time. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Hmm. Now, uh, just one uh, quick input to our president of Wheel Suresh Anoy and uh, Vice President Ratan Agarwal. What Admiral Puri has mentioned. Uh, wheels will need to get into a very serious uh, dialogue and interaction uh, with the scenic boards in the different villages through our manager, Mr. J. V. G. Krishnamurti, through Dr. Racha and others on the ground, including our you know young fellow and the field level coordinators, because that will help to synergize our actions and we will get a very large trained manpower resource available for wheels in all the villages that we want to work in. So uh, thank you for that, Admiral Puri. That is also very useful input. Now, the second aspect what I want to mention is that, you know, uh, the Indian civilization contribution to the world of in the area of sciences, arts, you know, knowledge, uh, progress, innovation, entrepreneurship through the last 10,000 years, has been absolutely phenomenal. And if you see whether it's yoga or uh, surgery or medicine or astronomy or uh, dance or music or festivals or yoga, whatever, you, Ayurveda, naturopathy, etc., etc., homeopathy. Vedas, you know, document a lot of it. Mahabharat, Ramayan, all historical aspects which are uh, phenomenal contributions to world knowledge. Uh, there was a study by The Economist, which itself is not a neutral paper vis-a-vis -vis India. It's quite against India's, you know, sort of professed positions. Uh, did a very good thorough research on the contributions to global GDP by different countries of the world, along with uh, The Economist did this study with uh, the International Monetary Fund and uh, consultancy Angus Madison. In that, they came out with the conclusions about which country had contributed how much to the world. Now, in the whole discussion, there was no mention of India, by the way. Whereas in the graph which they put out, the contribution by India to global GDP growth for the last 2000 years of documented history showed up as being more than 33% for the first 1000 years from year one to year 1000. In purchasing power parity terms, from the year 1000 to 1500, it showed up as being more than one fourth of the global GDP as one country. Now, a country which has made the biggest contribution to world history as per the graph put out by The Economist and International Monetary Fund and Angus Madison is not even mentioned even once in the entire discussion on the article the country with the biggest contribution over the last 2000 years. So that is the sort of attitude which India also has to 
you know, face as a challenge. Now, Atman Nirvarta, how will that help us cope with that is an important uh, part of it as to how the uh, narrative being written about the world growth, world history. So you find that the contributions by India on the global stage continued till the invasions by the Muslims and the Mughals started. Thereafter, it started going down. And then with the British, as you mentioned very clearly, Macaulay and the others, it went absolutely to zero practically. It is again increasing very slowly. And for me as an observer of uh, you know, global strategy, global dynamics, it appears that there is a revival of the Indian civilizational uh, aspirations. And that itself in the next few years will make a very marked change to India's position and contribution on the global stage. But we have a lot of questions which have been put by the participants and uh, by the panelists also and by others. Before I start uh, getting into those questions in detail, I would request uh, our chairman, Prashanji, to you know quickly come in with uh, his views and if he has any question. And thereafter, we will move to the questions by the others. Thank you. Prashanji? Uh, yeah, it has been a really excellent uh, um, you know, speech from uh, um, Admiral Puriji and uh, uh, really enjoyed the interaction also uh, about the 71 uh, you know, uh, war and whatever happened and your feedback. So it has been really wonderful, but uh, looking at the, there are almost 17 questions. So we, we really need to uh, economize and uh, uh, put forward the questions to uh, Admiral Puriji for uh, for his uh, you know sure. response okay thank you very much for surrendering your uh, you know time for uh, getting into these questions because that is very important participants are taking a lot of interest and uh, you know really putting in very very thoughtful comments and questions so the first question is by shri baskar uh, deoji is there a structure or divine root Somebody who's all rose with standing ovation for Mary Carmen, led by Senator Raphael Cruz, and thanked him for doing exactly what they demanded that he do. Can we mute the person who's yeah, can you most mute um because none of those Republican senators, not one of them, meant a single word that they said about the social The Medicare judge in the case gave Donald Trump 24 hours to make up his mind about whether he wants to oppose the motion. Go, go ahead, Ambassador Kapoor, go ahead. Ambassador he's, Kapoor, you are on mute. Yeah, he's on mute. Yeah, I was also muted. Thank you. Now I'm unmuted. So see, Bhaskar Deoji has written uh, this for Admiral Puri. Is there a structure or a defined route for startups in the defense sector to work with the government of India? Over to you, Admiral. Mm. Uh, the As far as the government of India to... Uh, assist startups is concerned uh, there are three initiatives one is called uh, idex i don't know indian defense something I, I don't really understand but it basically gives startups a grant with on which they have to also put a matching amount and the grant is in in crores I, I, the figure used to be a, a crore and a half but now I think it has been increased. Uh, and they, it, from that point onwards, then I, I do believe that once a startup has produced, uh, shown the, uh, uh, show, uh, come up with the idea and he has given the proof of concept within this, 
productionizing that idea and taking it forward, there is a, a lot of interest that is being taken by the Ministry of Defense today. But I am frankly not aware of where we have reached in that area. Because to me, the critical thing is how to take the thing up from technology readiness level 3, 4, which is understanding the know why of the whole thing, to the know how of how to productionize it and put it in the market. Now, that process has to start, but there, there are some areas, yes, in, in, in the area of small drones and all that, that they have come up. But I think that also needs to be understood is that in major areas of defense, like you know, at, at the platform level, it has got to be a, an R&D laboratory type of effort. For example, the US, um, for all its, uh, you know, uh, uh, has got almost 200 laboratories for the working for the three armed forces. The whole DRDO consists of 46 lakhs. Of course, these laboratories then go to the academia and uh, interact with them. So I believe that uh, these, they, so there is this IDEX, then the, there is a technology development fund, which is administered by the Defense Research and Development Organization. They see uh, proposals, either they can be suomoto or they put them uh, and ask for an expression of interest themselves and then fund these up to a level of something like 50 crores. I mean, that's the amount of funding they can provide. And, uh, and, and, and there have been some successes. I know in this area, I know there have been some successes in getting the things productionized and put into the, put, but these are largely things of interest to the various laboratories in the DRDO with the systems that they are dealing with. Uh, mostly of that nature, or if they see that there would be usefulness of that particular innovation in their future projects. I mean, that, that is my understanding. Right. So these are the these these two are definitely there, and there's I think one more, um, which is run by the Air Force and one run by the um, uh, one run by the DRDO itself, which is. Uh, dare to dream they call it and they but they they there they give a prize and a good prize but they don't take the whole thing forward themselves necessarily okay. so these these are the initiatives that i know of beyond that the whole startup system is there run by um, where the education the number of iits uh, are uh, also having uh, innovation centers and all that today and DRDO has another thing that they have done to encourage all this, the, especially the IITs, where they have set up centers of excellence. Uh, there's one center of excellence in Chennai, I know of, one center in, in Delhi. Uh, one, I think, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe I think there's something in Kharagpur and Kanpur also, but I'm not very sure of that. So these centers of excellence, excellence are for a particular set of technologies. Um, which, they, which they want to deal with in those centers. These are administered by the IIT, so funding is provided by the Defense Research and Development Organization. Okay, thank you so much. That is indeed very useful. Uh, the next one is primarily a comment. Uh, this is from uh, Ravi Bhatia from Australia. Uh, he mentions that Admiral Raman Puri must be lauded for being brutally forthright, et cetera. And then he explains the reasons for his comment about how the earlier governments have been very negligent in defense production matters with uh, specific details of projects, et cetera. Uh, the next one is a question by Yashpalji. Uh, is there a document that defines Atmanirbharta and how we plan to achieve it in a defined time frame? Uh, and he goes on further to state that it can be done just like John Kennedy established a goal of landing a man on the moon uh, in 1960 before the decade was out. The goal was achieved in 1969. All the necessary knowledge is currently available. We simply need to get to work. Yashpal is from IIT Kharagpur, 1963 batch. So the question is, is there a document? that defines Atmanirbhata and how we plan to achieve it in a defined time frame. Uh, 
I think there is a broad policy understanding that we don't want to import anything. <laughs> that is, that, that policy understanding is there. And I think it is being pushed quite hard, because though from various levels and various lobbies, things keep coming up uh, here and there, and the system has to deal with it. I don't want to go into the details of how this, what, what are happening and what will happen. As far as uh, a defined time frame, to my knowledge, there is there is uh, the armed forces put up a long term technology uh, long term uh, uh, long term integrated perspective plan that's what they had put out at one time and uh, now they're going to put up a defense a 10 year defense capability plan on which uh, i suppose various agencies will work to see how how it is to be achieved uh, but I, 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 the a, a setting a goal in the manner that you are saying, um, I think the first thing we need to do, frankly, is to make sure that what we can do, we do ourselves. That has to become the cornerstone of setting, you know, these uh, very high goals, which no doubt should be set. I mean, the goal should be we will be Atma Nirbharta. Atman Irbar in A, B, C, D, E, G, S technology by so and so and so uh, platforms by so and so date. Uh, to a large extent, I believe uh, in our uh, uh, many of our requirements, we will be we are quite capable. But some things require to be done at a national level in the sense if you want a, a good, um, say, uh, totally uh, an airborne early warning capability based on your own. Uh, on platform, then there must be a availability of an A350 aircraft in the country. So if you can't get that till that capability comes, and I think that is some distance away. So we must do things which we can do and we can do in the next 10 years uh, quietly. And in this area, I would be very happy to say whether it is radar technology, whether it is electronic warfare technology, all this is today available and we don't have to go anywhere. Only uh, we have to tell this to our lobbyists and the decision makers that you really don't need to go anywhere. Right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Sam. The next question which we have uh, is more of a comment again, except uh, the last bit. You have already answered most of it. So if you don't want to get into further detail, we will accept that. Uh, I'll just read it out, then we'll go on to the next question. The defense technology is highly developed in the first world and given our level of current defense technology today, it will take a long time to catch up with advances in technology, meaning in the Western world. How can we tune Atman Nirbharta to hasten the process of development when many skilled Indians are headed to the US for doing research? Any quick comment on that, uh, Admiral Saab? You know, when I had, I am part of an organization called Youth for Nation, where we are basically trying to tell the uh, youth of the importance of leadership to be able to take the nation forward and why they should vote and make sure that they vote for the right person. Anyway, in this process, I often tell, when I'm addressing these colleges, I do tell our youngsters, for God's sake, don't become international coolies. Do something, yes. When you innovate something, innovate something here, make the nation grow and make sure that we move to developing our own products and not just provide services. Right. Now, this has to be a change of thought process at a very vast level in the country. Uh, as to the specific question that he has got, I frankly can't say very much more beyond this because I am not, uh, you know, I'm 16 years retired today. And uh, uh, the level of technology that is available, I think, uh, I, I would say, you know, we have to beat the competition. With whom are we competing? We are competing with China and competing with Pakistan, which only means we are competing with China as far as the armed forces are concerned. Right. Because pa Pakistan is of no, I mean, Pakistan will get what China gives. Yes. For that matter, 
whether it is any other country in our neighborhood, our, our, our competition essentially, and if we can compete with China, we are good enough. Yeah. We, we will aim to go to the West when we think of becoming a super war in the year 2050. But at this point in time, for the next 15 years, we have to concentrate on how to develop technology and this thing to be Atmanirbar in areas where we are dealing with China. Yeah. So in here, I can just add a quick comment. Uh, Ambassador Rabid Hussain, IAS, etc., very well-known uh, statesman, he was once mentioning in a talk that he, I invited him to give in Georgetown University, whereas, uh, you know, faculty member for a year to train uh, young people to become diplomats. Uh, he mentioned during the talk that uh, the then Prime Minister, Mrs. Gandhi, used to all the time talk about uh, brain drain. So you, I remember even when she came to IIT Delhi for our convocation when we were getting the graduation degrees, she talked for 90% of the time about 35, 40 minutes on brain drain and just five minutes congratulating the graduates on their achievements. So he says that even during meetings with their advisors, it would be the same thing. Any agenda item, any agenda thing, it would all get, always uh, revert to brain drain. So in one of the meetings, uh, Abed Hussain mentioned that, uh, Madam, if we try to stop the brain drain, the brain will be in the drain. So it was only after he mentioned that, that uh, suddenly the focus started getting back onto the agenda items. And later, of course, as we know, brain drain has also become brain gain for India. So Mr. Trichur Parmeshwaran, I hope uh, this answers, you know, your uh, comments and questions. Uh, the next one is by Prakash Malik. Uh, I think I will be able to attempt an answer to that. Uh, you, he has said, uh, Prakash Malik has said that uh, Vice Admiral Puri has made uh, some very good and important observations and his analysis is very enlightening. I'm a graduate in metallurgical engineering from Banaras Sindhu University, 1960. I find it very painful that none of the universities or institutes of technology today come in the top 100 in the ranking in the world. I would appreciate it very much if you would care to comment on what we need to do to improve the quality of education in our universities and institutes of technology. We have a task force which has been set up uh, by some of the members of WHEELS, uh, some of the IIT alumni, some of the IIT directors, some of the others from outside the circle also, which is dealing with this issue in great depth. We have had a lot of learning in the past few weeks and months of discussions because some of the IIT directors have done a lot of work. Now, 40% of this ranking is very opaque and is not open to any sort of analysis or questioning or understanding. And it just talks about uh, the sort of uh, reputation or credibility of the institutes uh, from feedback obtained by the rankings institutions from whom and who has said what, nothing is revealed. So you can imagine that these rankings are very, very flawed. And also they are very commercialized transactional rankings because if universities provide some endowments or funds to these ranking agencies, uh, then their ranks also go up significantly. The IITs and the others have not done that and don't intend to do that. So uh, some other methods of sort of uh, challenging this system of ranking or, you know, working within the system to sort of, uh, you know, beating them at their own game uh, has to be worked out. The impact of the IITs has been tremendous in the sense that uh, even in the US, there is a house resolution 227 of 2005, which puts on record in a codified way in the US Parliament about the contribution being made by the IITs and the Indian diaspora to the US economy and to job creation in the US. No other university has been recognized in this fashion, including neither MIT nor Stanford nor Harvard nor any other university or college or campus. So there are things which are happening contrary to the rankings also. But if we have to sort of uh, also sort of, you know, so, uh, deal with this challenge of the way rankings are constructed, which is flawed uh, 
in the first instance. A greater exposure needs to be given to the world about how this ranking itself is to be corrected and rectified in the first instance. And the IITs are very, very high on certain parameters. They rank like, you know, 9.7 out of 10, 10 out of 10, etc. 9 out of 10 in many areas of scholarship. But in some aspects, they have some work to cover. For example, the facilities available in the laboratories, the facilities available in the dorms, the facilities available in the lavatories, the toilets, etc., and the campus. So those, a lot of the listeners here, participants here can actually contribute by making endowments to the IITs to improve those facilities and capacities. The other aspect where IITs and others face some serious uh, lower points out of those 10.10% 10 which is allotted is the globalization of the faculty and globalization of the students. Now, globalization of the students is a very difficult uh, area because if you have the joint entrance exam with the, over a million people participating from India and only a few thousand are selected, I know for a fact that any foreigners who, you know, sort of uh, participate in these exams, the joint entrance exams, uh, it's very difficult for them to clear the exams in the first instance itself. So the competition is so severe that globalization uh, has to be worked in some other manner and some other process, which has to be defined and approved, etc. And then that part will be taken care of. Similarly, the globalization of faculty faces similar challenges. I don't want to make this a lecture on that. So I'll stop here and go on to the next question. But yes, yeah, there's a lot of thought uh, being given to this aspect also. Just for I, uh, If I can add to this, yes. it is something like our ranking on human rights in India. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's the same story over there. Absolutely. I mean, if <laughs> some of the participants here decide to give endowments to these ranking agencies, saying that we mm -hmm. think that the IITs or the Indian universities of the top rank are the best in the world, suddenly that 40% mm -hmm. from 0 out of mm -hmm. 40 for the IITs will become 40 out of 40, and suddenly you are mm -hmm. in the top 10 uh, overnight. So that's the sort of system of ranking, just to explain it to you in very, you know, very straightforward terms. But anyway, as I said, uh, the work is being done on that separately. And over the next few years, there may be some changes, either in the system of rankings or in the rankings of the institutes from India. Okay. Uh, if yes. I may add one point here, yes, uh, you know, which relates to today's uh, subject or topic of Atmanirbhata, you know, in the IITs, we need to have uh, more allocation for R&D. And that will also go a long way for uh, the, uh, you know, the ranking process. Yes. No, you are absolutely right. But already, uh, Prashanji, in the R&D, the rankings, even with the spars and meager uh, resources, many of the IITs rank uh, like in the uh, 9 out of 10 space, just for your background information. So that is the sort of efficiency which uh, they appreciate and they you know, already accept it. But anyway, that is uh, uh, okay. Then uh, Srikant Sinaji has mentioned that please spell name of the two shows mentioned. Um, Admiral Puri. Yeah, I think uh, since your brother is there, you could do it. Is Avrod, Avrod, okay. Avrod 1 and Avrod 2. Yes. Avrod 1 deals with this Uri incident. Avrod 2 deals with, uh, um, you know, it make you understand why demonetization took place in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. So it's an uh, overlap between the economy and the strategic concern and security aspects. Et As a matter of fact, there's another serial called Family Man, which I, again, I find it deals with the, uh, it also deals with uh, terrorist situations emanating in the South. So these are good serials. I don't know why they are not publicized uh, more than what they have been. I mean, I just by ch chance need to go into them. So Shrikant Sinaji, you can go to Sony Live and both Avrod, A-V-R-O-D-H, uh, season one, season two are uh, there. You can access that and, uh, you know, it's a very interesting serial. So, and Family Man is also available on the Netflix. Right. Yeah. And my brother's name is Colonel Prabhat Kapu. He acts as one of the former terrorist uh, chieftains who's uh, now sort of uh, over his past uh, bad, uh, you know, role. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. 
So, uh, okay. Then there are some questions by somebody called anonymous attendee. We do not entertain such questions or comments by anonymous people till they come forth with their true identities. So I'm sorry, we will not be able to respond to your uh, comments. Uh, Ravi Bhatia again from Australia has mentioned what are the specific skills that are required. I guess he's talking in terms of the, uh, you know, the scenic boards and the wheels overlap. So, uh, you know, we can request Admiral Puri if uh, you would oh, like to comment or... Uh, frankly, I, I, it would be difficult for me to comment because I basically... Uh, it is something that may vary from region to region, village to um, cluster of villages to cluster of villages. It depends on the, uh, you know, what are the solutions they are seeking for and what we can do to provide them with the innovation and uh, with the local resources. I mean, that is what I feel at, at the policy level. Yeah. So like we have this telemedicine operation, which uh, requires operators at the village level, uh, which can easily utilize the skills which already exist with these armed forces retirees. So that, for example, the Wheels Health Council is planning to increase the mapping from about 300 of these telemedicine operation centers in India to 10,000. So I'm sure with the cooperation of the scenic boards, the mapping can be increased very, very significantly in a very quick time frame. The water project which we are doing with the Himachal Pradesh government for rejuvenation of uh, Springs, for example, uh, with the active participation of the uh, Senics, retired Senics, again, it can be scaled up uh, phenomenally. And the smart village definition itself uh, is utilizing the strengths of the community and strengths of the you know uh, wheels, for example. So the strengths of the community, we include the strengths of the retirees from the armed forces, uh, suddenly multiplies. Then we also talk about R, S, M is for measurement, A is for applicable, R is for replicable and scalable. So for making it scalable again, utilizing these uh, Senex will help scaling it to a national scale and achieving the wheels goal of impacting 20% of the rural population over the next 10 years. Uh, so, uh, and making it more sustainable. So all those aspects, I think answers this question by Sri Ravi Bhatiaji. Then Atma Ram Ji says, again, similar, it's a similar question or same question. Uh, the Indian government does not seem to have a policy of programs to utilize the rich and robust skill set and experience of retirees, both on civil side and from the armed services. This is a lost opportunity. Several other countries are also guilty of this issue as well. Yes, that is correct. I know of a lot of my colleagues from the IAS and the police service and the foreign service. Uh, who after uh, they attain the age of 60, uh, suddenly they face this vacuum. And um, you know, after having a very rich life with a lot of hard work and very challenging work, uh, suddenly they are doing nothing, which is very sad for the country and for them. So it has to be some thought out uh, structure which utilizes their experiences. Uh, Indian, mess the next quest comment is by Sri Ravi Bhatia. The Indian message is not getting through to the Western audiences to the required extent. This needs to be addressed. Yes, of course, and everybody's um, you know, inputs on this will be very useful for writing articles, for writing to the Western media that, uh, you know, why are you always propagating uh, anti-India sort of line? You need to put forward uh, other articles also, which are more balanced. So that those sort of comments and letters to the editor and articles by all of you, Saying keep that it's an article on India and keep on sending it to all the Western media and then ask them why they are not publishing it. And do they need only anti-Indian articles uh, which they approve for publishing? Or why can't they publish uh, neutral or positive articles also for a change? Those sort of questions will automatically put a lot of pressure. And that same pressure can be put through other uh, channels which are, and you have the whole world available to you through social media, through Twitter, through Facebook, and mention these comments there. Now I sent this article, article is uh, posted below, and uh, these newspapers refuse to publish it, whereas any anti-Indian um, article they publish in one minute. So I have seen as a diplomat, for example, even in Nepal, journalists who are Hindu journalists writing articles against India-Nepal interests, 
and when we used to ask them that why are they doing that when they're having their uh, you know peg of whiskey or a drink in our house in the evening and they say that when we publish these articles in any newspaper we get uh, so many a few thousand rupees from the pakistan embassy for that article and we get a few more thousand than that from the chinese embassy so this is our bread and butter so that is a sort of response they give in a real life a real time basis and uh, you know so the world has to understand that and combat that through the power now available to everybody through the social media any comments uh, prashant ji or admiral sir or we go on to the next one yeah i think we can go on to the next okay one. thank you uh atma ram ji is again asking which part of the government is taking the lead in this area so it's currently the iits and the uh, directors and the iit ecosystem and some others and we are uh, the good news is that uh, a large percentage of the civil servants today civil services today the ias officer the ifs officers and the others are from the iits every year for the last 15 20 years about 30 35% successful aspirants who have joined the civil services are from the iits so a large number of secretaries joint secretaries ambassadors deputy ambassadors are from the iits so it's easier to now form a joint uh, sort of message and joint system joint uh, you know uh, sort of effort uh, to overcome this issue of i just want to make one point here you know iits of course i work closely with some iits on certain issues iits are good to come up to the stage as an academic organization to come up to the stage of giving you a proof of concept and maybe a small prototype in that area but the next step to that as i said before is how to get engaged with an industry to be able to or funding of a startup which forms an industry to productionize that i mean uh, iit chennai i saw you know a startup doing working on a five axis uh, machine but uh, the challenge for him is and there uh, it is not just the lobby it is also the uh, the various uh, mncs etc who are not interested in your being able to so it is not just a, 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 a issue of you know the talent doing something in the iit it's a it, it's a much larger challenge of making sure that what that youngster has produced and that requires i suppose intervention of, of the leading industrialists in the country yes. it requires the intervention of the governments yes. and in, as far as the indian industry is concerned my impression is they are not risk taking yeah they 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 need to get into that mood otherwise they'll get wiped out themselves absolutely oh, that's right. uh, uh, i think we to need to yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. have a time keeping to do yes <laughs> so i'm going to club the next three questions into one yeah uh, this is by anil kumar and by siddharth bummi and by ravi batia uh, admiral saab the successful chinese model differs from what is being suggested here is there a need for a different management model than our current model then it says uh, uh, is in your estimate how many years are we behind to china uh, for parity in indian defense capabilities and then uh, the third one says public sector in india like bel bhel sail iocl etc has been building in india for decades does atmanirbharta refer to improving efficiencies of procedures or is it just political jingoism need clear definition and directives to understand better uh, let me say what the uh, what our industry has been doing the, um, basically the defense uh, dpsus which were largely producing or for that matter the ordnance factories i said they all suffered from what i call uh, for license production you it will be it's surprising that their own r&d r&d setup i mean a, a a laboratory can give you a prototype which they put through trials and say that it already meets the requirements but now to productionize it you require production engineering to go into it you have to do some redesigning also now that capability in the industry 
was especially in some of the, some areas was, was just missing uh, companies like bharat electronics were better off so you will find there is larger successes in radars in electronic warfare systems and all that but even there the demand from the system to them was largely why don't we get it from xyz you know this in, uh, and the the trials that would be set up for an indian system would be so rigorous while we will accept certificates from uh, you know inspection certificates from an organization whether it is us or israel or anyone or ua so my point is this has this is something that we are now changing we this is something that a change I, you know a cultural change does not come about because somebody said you change it it takes some time but i am glad to say that yes there is a danda on it and i i at times say to administer india you require not a hand but a handle <laughs> okay so 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 that is being put in place uh, and i hopefully that will start working right. but it will take time thank you thank you i am just going to read out some of the other comments and questions and not expect an answer since ratan ji our time keeper is uh, you know telling us uh, uh, about that we are running out of time so uh, some of the other uh, prakash malik ji says in order for any goal or objective of atmanirbharta to succeed it must meet the smart concept which is similar definition to the smart village which we defined earlier in a white paper also he says smart should be s for specific m for measurable a for attainable l for realistic and t for trackable thank you uh, prakash malik ji uday lokre says everyone is wise on hindsight we must recognize that everything follows the s curve and we are now at the inflection point or take off point in the s curve china was in hibernation for almost 30 years and suddenly woke up in a new avatar and robbed the world of its sleep should we follow this model also question mark should we resort to reverse engineering just like the chinese to accelerate atmanirbharta then uh, raj says that uh, how many days of oil supply does india currently have and how will we achieve at energy atmanirbharta and sunil salon cases how do we get rid of jugad mentality uh, there are other questions which are posted in the chat box also which uh, i think i will not uh, get into currently and uh, with this i am going to uh, stop the question answer time because we already beyond the allotted time uh, so over to you prashant ji for concluding remarks uh, thank you both uh, admiral raman puri ji and uh, uh, I, i just want to say something about the chinese model that they want us to copy if you want to do reverse engineering then forget about state of art because whatever you use is search in do reverse engineering on is 10 years 15 years old and that has been said you compare the jf 17 with the chinese produce and the uh, lca which we produce yeah that's so, i mean uh, technologically they are uh, you know uh, and in the capability they are world apart what they called uh, you know uh, stealth aircraft they got a canard stealth aircraft don't have canards so my point is that you know what uh, there is a uh, Uh, the global times before we will start uh, a lot of propaganda will start off your your week your all this let's not get taken in by it we'll have to see them in battle one day in nathula they got such a beating that they would have remembered so and in galwan the same thing has happened so let's see i mean i, I don't I, i yes in one area we do need to come up very quickly and that is in cyber space cyber um in our total telecom setup which has suffered because of wrong policy strategically wrong policy decisions that have been taken in the year 2004 5 when i think mr manmohan singh was in power and the higher organization was guiding it thank you um yeah so i think uh, i will uh, do the concluding remarks uh, uh, once again thank you admiral raman puri ji and ambassador kapoor ji for your excellent and insightful remarks and for moderating the q and a session uh, thanks to iit north 
Texas IIT-NT, which is the Alumni Association of North Texas uh, in Dallas for supporting the event. Thanks also to the entire team of volunteers and collaborators who worked very hard to make this event happen. There are uh, many key takeaways from today's webinar, which have which will be compiled by our team led by Kavita Kapoor, and they will also be published on our website. A link to today's event and recording will also be on our website, which is www.wheelsglobal.org, and where there is also a donate button, use that. Finally, thanks to all the attendees, and we hope you will join us for the next webinar on 21st August with Mr. Sunil Gupta, CEO of Avis in India, who has recently published a wonderful book on Shairi, all in English, along with the meanings of these masterpieces. The book has received rave reviews in Pan IIT Book Club. Mr. Gupta has generously offered the proceeds from the sale of special hardbound edition of this book during his presentation to the Wheels Global Foundation. The speaker is an expert on the subject, and I highly recommend you to register for the event and buy the book and help us all at the Wheels. Stay safe, keep well, enjoy uh, uh, the rest. Uh, Prashanji, can I make a, a personal request from my side also? Sure, sure. I, I, uh, I talked about this Youth for Nation to all of you. Uh, our greatest challenge in doing this is to get connected to various colleges. And uh, so if uh, any of you can get Youth for Nation, we have got a website uh, available. It is Youth for and Nation. Um, it is, uh, we would be grateful because we have got enough resources. There are enough retired, uh, um, you know, uh, bureaucrats. There are enough retired senior arm, armed forces officers who are available to take the message to the student. And we feel this is important for the country that we continue to have the right leadership in the country. And uh, so if anyone of you can uh, help us get in, in touch with uh, your contacts in various colleges or uh, universities in India, we would be very happy. Thank and you. And Admiral Puri, we will also be glad to add that on our partner page. So that yeah. way people can get attention on that. We'll okay. do that. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Have a uh, wonderful week. Thank you. Be safe. Be safe. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'll have a rerun of
It was a really wonderful session, <laughs> right? But it was it was really wonderful session. <laughs> Stop recording. Right. send the uh, question answers and the chat to everybody mm -hmm. except to admiral puri because i don't have his details if somebody